Parts of Call. Beyond blue horizons, far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for of call. In the heart of Europe, stretching from the Baltic Sea to the Swiss Alps, lies Germany. Her medieval cities still seem to have come to life from some vast picture book of legends. Even the industrial Germany of today conceals many a village whose customs are those of feudal days and whose youths and maidens wear the colorful peasant costumes, the origins of which are lost in the shadowy past. Crossing the windy North Sea, our steamer sails up the river Elba and anchors at the docks of Hamburg, largest seaport in Europe and distributing center for all the continent. In the great public squares are enormous markets and the business section is connected with the suburbs by innumerable tiny canals on which small steamers ply from morning to night. From Hamburg, we take a train across the province of Hanover, birthplace of a line of English kings, and find ourselves in the old university town of Magdeburg, early home of Martin Luther. It is a summer afternoon in the year 1505. Young Martin Luther and his father are walking home through the dense forest. Martin. Martin. Yes, Father. I have spoken to you three times. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. I, I was thinking. Uh, that is what you always say nowadays when I speak to you. Come. Walk faster. It's beginning to rain. You see, Father, It's I... a good thing to be interested in your study of law, my son. But lately you are spending too much time discussing religion with the monks. But I'm interested in what they have to say. It was your wish that I should study law. I will not argue with you again on that subject. Quick, Martin. Now let us take shelter in the woodsman's cottage at the bend of the road. God, himmel, what lightning! Keep away from the trees, Father. Martin, Martin, my son. Are you all right? Speak to me. Father. Uh, thank God you are not killed. The lightning struck you, Martin. Yes. Come, get up. We must hurry home. It is a sign from heaven, Father. As Saul received a sign on the road to Damascus. <laughs> You're talking foolishly, my boy. You are still dazed. I know what I'm saying. I've been thinking about it for a long time, and I've done nothing. Now God has struck me down with the lightning to give me a sign that I must follow him. What? What are you talking about? I'm going to enter the monastery at Erdogan. But your mother and I will have no one if you do. You, you can't leave us alone. God has called me, Father. Can't you see I have no choice? Tomorrow, you and Mother can walk with me as far as the gates of the monastery. The blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost descend upon you, Martin Luther. May you be blessed in the priestly order, and may you offer a pleasing oblation for the sins and offenses of the people unto Almighty God to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The 
I'm in, my son. I've come to ask your advice, Father. I will be glad to help you if I can. Sit here. Thank you. You know I am a rich man. Yes, I know. I have been told that by the payment of a certain sum of money, I may obtain remission of my sins. Oh, you are not the first to come to me with such a tale, my son. Where did you hear it? Father John Tetzel is teaching it. Do you think you can buy your way into heaven? Oh, no, Father, but my friend Herr Wilhelm Stettler was granted... My son, I have known for a long time that the power of Holy Church to grant remission of sins is being abused and even sold for money. I am only a poor monk. But what one man can do, I will. Those who teach that absolution may be granted by money alone are blasphemers. Yet if money is needed to carry on the work of the church, surely indulgence may be granted to the man who gives it. I cannot help you, my son. You did not come for my advice, but in the hope that my opinion would strengthen your desire. But, Father... These abuses must stop, and I am determined to do what I can to stop them. Months go by, during which Martin Luther finds himself opposed to many powerful dignitaries of the church. Finally, on October 1st, 1517, Martin Luther addresses a crowd in the great square before the cathedral at Wittenberg. I have prepared 95 points on which I dissent from the teachings of the established church. It is for the high authorities of the church to answer them. Here they are. I will nail my 95 theses to the very doors of the cathedral. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! September 1520. His Majesty Charles V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Martin Luther, we have been empowered by the Holy Father at Rome to hear the case against you. You are charged with heresy. The Holy Father has issued a bull of excommunication against you. But it will not be read until we have heard the case. Are you ready to stand trial? I am ready, Your Majesty. This parchment before me is the edict of excommunication. Let your eyes rest upon it while you answer my questions. I am ready to answer, sire. These books on the table are said to be yours. Written over a period of three years. Did you write them? Yes, Your Majesty. I wrote them all. Do you wish to examine them? I know them well. Then do you know they contain dangerous heresies? I believe them to contain the truth. You must recant. You must admit they are lies. But they are not lies. Under penalty of excommunication, you must recant. I neither can nor will revoke anything I have written in those books. For it is neither safe nor right to act against my conscience. God help me. Amen. Silence. I hand you the papal edict. I will take it and throw it into the fire. But Martin Luther was not burned at the stake. His teachings formed the beginnings of Protestant churches throughout the world. In all the German states, Lutherans grew more and more powerful and exercised a decisive influence in the disastrous Thirty Years' War which ravaged the country a hundred years later. It is the year 1735. In a small room in the royal palace, furnished almost as severely as the cell of a monk, Frederick I, King of Prussia, has summoned his eldest son, also named Frederick. I am here, father. Bah! I am here, father. You speak like a damned Frenchman. I've always told you I hated the German language, father. It is harsh and guttural. When I am king... You may never be king of Prussia. I should not mind that, father. You should not mind? No. So, you would rather spend your time with your Latin books and your flute and your French companions? Of course I would. Why should I wish to become king? After a lifetime of seeing what a king is like... You... You have always been harsh and cruel. You treated my mother as if she were an animal. You think there's nothing worthwhile in the world but discipline, discipline, discipline. I'm sick of the very word. I'm sick of being made to eat coarse food and sleep on hard beds and be cold and miserable because you believe that's the way to become accustomed to the life of a soldier. And I don't want to be a soldier. But if I must, I want to be a man first. 
And I suppose being a man means you want to marry Amelia, the daughter of the English king, eh? Oh, yes, Father. Oh, she is adorable, and what a queen she will be. And your sister has fallen in love with Amelia's brother, the Prince of Wales. Yes. Oh, a very good alliance that will make for Prussia, with Wilhelmina married to the King of England. So? Mm, you will be glad to hear the news I have for you this morning. What is it? You are not to marry Amelia. But, Father! Nor is Wilhelmina to marry the Prince of Wales. This time, in spite of you and your sister and your mother, I will say what is to be done. I have arranged a marriage for you with Elizabeth Christina, cousin of Charles of Austria. I won't marry her. I tell you, I won't. Yes, you will marry her. You will learn that I am your master. Five years later, his father dies, and young Frederick becomes Frederick II. Changes from an irresponsible prince to a serious-minded king. Takes personal charge of the government. Revises laws, institutes tax reforms, builds up the army into an invincible fighting machine. Becomes known as Frederick the Great. Heart and soul for Prussia, he makes many friends at home, but enemies abroad. Finally, one morning, he sits in his study dictating a letter to Maria Theresa. Go on, go on, write as I speak. I write, Your Majesty, frankly, that she may see I have nothing to conceal, but neither have I anything to fear. Your Majesty has not answered my questions as to whether her military preparations are directed against Prussia. If this letter is not answered, we shall be obliged to interpret it as an unfriendly act. And you may enter. Your Majesty, Captain Muller ordered me to report to you at once. Here is a letter. He intercepted mm. Hmm. And the alliance between France, Sweden, and Austria is an accomplished fact. If we... Orderly. Yes, sir. My compliments to the general. Ask him to come to me at once. We'll cross the Saxon frontier before dawn on Friday. For seven years, Frederick, almost alone, fights Austria, France, Russia, Saxony, and Sweden. And at the end of that war, Prussia has become one of the great powers. Frederick bends his tremendous energy to restoring his country. From the balcony of his palace, he speaks to the people. Pomerania and Newmark are to be free from taxation for two years. Those whose lands have been wasted in the war will receive corn for seed. And all war horses will be distributed throughout Prussia to farms where they may be needed. <laughs> But Prussia's rising sun is not always clouded by wars. From her ancient cities and villages come poets and musicians, some of them to be numbered among the world's immortals. Such a one is Goethe, poet, philosopher, statesman, scientist. His life, strangely twisted by a tragic love, he pours out his heart in his verse. As he grows older, his friends are few. But among them is Johann von Schiller, poet and playwright, who, while visiting Goethe one day, notices a sheet of music on the poet's desk. Why, Goethe, what's that music there? Oh, it's another composition sent me by that young Ludwig von Beethoven. Another? Yes. He's constantly sending music he's written to fit my verses. You speak as if you thought nothing of it. Herr von Beethoven is a very brilliant young man. No doubt. But I am not interested in him. But Goethe, have you never heard him play? No. You should by all means. I've seen him sit down at the piano and improvise so brilliantly that you'd swear it was a composition he'd labored on for weeks. I wish you'd let him see your Faust. My Faust? Oh, I know it's the pride of your heart. All the more reason why the music should be written by someone like young Beethoven, unhampered by traditions and not afraid to compose as he feels. No, Schiller. My Faust, as you know, is my heart. Perhaps I shall never let anyone see it. You know I have been writing it and changing it for years. But don't you see, a man who admires you as Beethoven must 
is precisely the person to interpret what you have written and set to music. No, I can't see it, Chilean. Ten years pass. Goethe at last finishes his great Faust, but he has remained firm in his refusal to meet Ludwig von Beethoven, whose brilliance is a sensation of the day. Because the Empress has sent word that she wishes to meet him, Goethe has come to Teplitz in Bohemia, where he has encountered a friend. I was so glad to learn you were here, Herr Goethe, and at last my ambition is to be fulfilled. What ambition, Bettina? To have you meet Ludwig van Beethoven. He has been here a week. The court is mad about him. Beethoven again. I tell you, there is no one like him here, Goethe, as you will see when you meet him. I must admit he has genius. I heard him play last night. And you did not speak to him? No. When you know how he has longed for years to meet you. Oh, there was such a crowd. And, of course, the Grand Duke and the Empress and all their party pressed around the piano when they finished. And it what... is something that you have at last heard him play. I am to meet him this afternoon. Tomorrow I will let you know what we say to each other. Every word, if you wish it. I know you will be charmed with him, as everyone is. I hope so. I must warn you. He is growing very deaf. A deaf composer? Yes. Oh, what a tragedy. Must stop our walk. But what about all these people? Pardon me, I did not hear you. What about all these people? Oh, let them wait. Come, let us go through this way. You will offend the Grand Duke and Duchess. What do I care? You know I have dreamed of meeting you since I was a child. You must not think I haven't appreciated the music you sent me. It's very hard for me to accept kindness from anyone. I have never known just how I could reply to you. Well, that was nothing. You speak as if I had offended you in some other way. Frankly, Herr Goethe, I'm disappointed beyond words at your reception of my playing. But why? Oh, you mustn't say that. It, it moved me very greatly. You're trying to be kind. I looked at you the moment I'd finished. If I had seen in your face what I feel when I have read one of your poems, I should have been transported. But I saw nothing. But you do not... You I... must know how stimulating it is to gain the applause of those who understand if you do not reckon me as your equal, who will? Must I play to the mob to find understanding? I see. I have been right all these years in refusing to meet you. I knew we should never understand each other. Good day, uh, Beethoven. Well, Herr Goethe, have you... Yes, I have met him. And he spoke to me as no one has spoken for years. I will not endure it, Bettina. Hereafter, I will ignore him. But, Herr Goethe, one slight misunderstanding. Oh, I should have been with you to explain you to each other. Surely we'll not Bettina, judge. I will never discuss this young man again. Whatever overtures he may make to me in the future will be answered by silence. The two bitter geniuses never met again. Both died a few years later lonely and disillusioned. Both left to Germany a priceless heritage of melody and song. But while the German people were learning the tender leader of Goethe, Otto von Bismarck is preparing to teach a doctrine that is to shape the world. In 1862, he is made premier and minister of foreign affairs. A few days later, he makes his first public announcement of his guiding policy. Russia must collect her forces and hold them in reserve for a favorable moment. The great questions of the time will be decided not by speeches and resolutions, but by blood and iron. Otto von Bismarck's power grows. 
1867, he engineers the North German Confederation and frames the new Constitution. Five years later, it is his strategy of blood and iron which wins the Franco-Prussian War. Finally, the German Empire is created. The Prussian king becomes emperor, and Otto von Bismarck, as imperial chancellor, reads the proclamation. We, Wilhelm by grace of God, king of Prussia, regard it as our duty to the whole fatherland to respond to the summons of the allied German princes and free cities, and to assume the German imperial title. 1889. Wilhelm II ascends the German throne. He summons the chancellor to a private audience. Awaiting Bismarck's arrival, he talks to his friend, the Grand Duke of Baden. But surely you do not think of asking for Bismarck's resignation, sir. I haven't decided yet. But, but I'm heartily tired of him. He's always lecturing and making long speeches about his experience. Now, now he's grooming his son to take his place when he's gone. I know how he must feel, Your Majesty, with his long-winded tirades. But if I were you, I would retain both the Bismarcks for the time being. Ah, yes, yes, you're right. But I shall have to teach him he is not the only man who can dictate German policy. I think it was being given a title that has made the old man insufferable. His Highness, Prince Otto von Bismarck. Mm, you'd better go. Yes, Your Majesty. Uh, good morning, Your Majesty. Your Grace. Good morning, Your Highness. I'm just leaving. I have sent for you because I have heard you disapprove of my attitude in the Russian matter. Our treaty with Russia expires next year. The safety of the Empire depends upon its renewal. Why should my cousin not wish to renew it? He is Tsar of Russia first, and your cousin second, sire. This mark. There are other men than yourself to consider when formulating the policy of the empire. I have held the empire together for a long time. But I am emperor now. There is another matter to discuss. I have reversed your decision in the miners' strike. Your Majesty, I am trying to provoke them into open rebellion so they can be dealt with. I mean to deal with them in my own way. What way? That I shall tell you when my plans are completed. Now you have our permission to retire. The breach between the emperor and his chancellor widens. A dozen times Bismarck is on the verge of dismissal. Finally, in 1890, goaded by Wilhelm's arrogance, Bismarck is forced to resign. The pilot leaves the ship. The man who spent his life to form the empire leaves it in the unproved hands of the young emperor. Germany bends before the glory and the power of the all-highest, the Caesar, called in the Teutonic language, Kaiser. For the next 20 years, Kaiser Wilhelm II, aided by one of the most complete espionage systems the world has ever seen, backed by a military machine, the strength of which the world was yet to know, plays an astute game of politics against equally astute opponents. For 20 years, no one knew how the cards were stacked, whether or not there were five aces in the deck. Then, on June 28, 1914, an assassin's bullet, tearing through the body of the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, breaks up the game. Six weeks later, Europe is in a grand free-for-all, which historians ironically call the war to end all wars. It is for those same historians to fix at some far distant date the guilt. Today, Kaiser Wilhelm, who has been called the arch criminal of all time, leads the life of a country gentleman in a quiet estate in Holland, writing learned monographs on the Chinese symbol for eternity. And today, the fatherland once more resounds with the tramp of marching men. The actors have different names, but the play is the same. And Germany is the same, the real Germany. The soul of its people remains untouched by the political maneuvers on the Wilhelmstrasse. Fair-haired German girls and blue-eyed boys still spend their bondayar hiking through the black forest, swimming in the Bonsee, climbing breathlessly up the steep path to the Heidelberg Schloss. In the little towns of Saxony, in the Rotskellers of Bavaria, no amount of politics can destroy the ambrosial delights of beer and burst. 
while the orchestra plays the songs they all know and love to sing. This is the soul of Germany, a simple singing people with a heritage of beauty and culture a thousand years old. It's sailing time again. We board a little steamer at the old cathedral town of Mainz for one of the most thrilling river trips in the world, the trip down the Rhine. Every hill overlooking the river, it seems, is topped by an ageless castle, and the valley's sides are checkerboarded with vineyards. Vineyards which produce a wine unequaled anywhere, pale Rhenish. There, see that rock stemming the current around this curve? That's where the Lorelei sat and sang. That's where the Lorelei sat and sang as she lured the sailors to destruction. And soon we shall pass under the bridge at Koblenz, where the invading American army was greeted as heroes by the war-sick Rhinelanders a few weeks after the armistice. And then Cologne, thrusting the lacy spires of her cathedral heavenward, and on to Dusseldorf and Essen, the great industrial towns. But there's the whistle. We've left Germany behind. And already we're at Dockside in Rotterdam, homeward bound. But we can't forget the beauty we have seen, the charm and simplicity we have found in the soul of Germany, in the hearts of her people. It isn't goodbye, Germany. It's Auf Wiedersehen, until we meet again. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call. <laughs>